asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Let's get our next guest on the programme. Looking forward to this chat, uh, I really am. Um, for many years he worked in the IT industry before, as he says himself, seeing the light and the error of his ways. He described that life as a dreary, soul-destroying life confined by the corporatocracy, and he got out of it. And when he did, he began to look into things for himself. He began to do his own research into uh, current events, current affairs, history. Um, and he's published four books so far, including The Falsification of History, um, RMS Olympic and Titanic's Last Secret. Um, I'll tell you about these books as well, by the way, and I will. Uh, also a book called Behind the Curtain, which is a two-volume book about the banking and monetary system. I'm going to tweet links to where you can find uh, these books. He can also be found at his website. Make a note of it. I will tweet it. Falsification of history.co.uk. That's falsification of history.co.uk. It's nice to welcome to the programme John Hamer. John, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm not too bad, thanks, Richie. Thanks for having me on. I've still got a bit of a bit of a cold and my voice is a little bit dodgy. It's one of those that's hung around for about six weeks, believe it or not. So uh, I'm stuck with it, I'm afraid, for the foreseeable, but uh, I'll you, do my best. You sound all right. It must have properly knocked you for six. Yeah, we were going to do this a couple of weeks ago, but um, better late yeah. than never. But if you've got um, a little bit of water handy and if you do get croaky, we can always take a break. Thanks, sure. thanks for coming on. Love, I, I, I love the, uh, the, the website. I love the articles on there. Um, Thanks. Some by you, most by you, and you have guest um, pieces on there as well. And yes. the, the books are fascinating as well. So it couldn't have just been the dreariness of the nine to five and the monotony of it. Now, I've had this myself. I I had it in commercial radio. In commercial radio, people have a very exciting job. Must have loved it, Richie. I hated it. It couldn't have just been that. Something must have happened to light a fire under you. Was there one thing, one event that um, you remember? Yeah, yeah, it's a good call, actually, Richie. Yeah, it was 9-11. 9-11 did it for me. I had suspicions before then. Like Diana's death sort of rang a few alarm bells, and I sort of vaguely looked into that for a little while, and then I sort of pushed it under the carpet again and cut, got on with my life. But all the time, there's this nagging thing in the back of my head that said, you know, the world isn't right. The world is not how it's portrayed to be. And uh, it was 9-11 that actually put the tin lid on it as soon as I started looking into that. Because I'm quite a curious guy by nature uh, and I hate being deceived. And um, that was really the catalyst for um, for packing my job in. And uh, I actually didn't know what I was going to do when I packed my job in. And yeah, I just sort of, to fill in time, I just started doing the research and, and it just all led on from there, really. And then the books came out. I started writing a few articles, mainly for my own benefit, and, and almost like a brain dump to get stuff out of my head onto paper so I could actually make, try and make some sense of the world. And then I started writing a few articles, and one or two websites picked up on it. And my first book, Falsification of History, was just like a, I stitched all those articles together, if you like, to make them into a book. And it just sort of went from there, and it sort of snowballed. We'll talk about these books. Um did it sit easy with you finding coming to the conclusion that dark agents wherever they come from or wh wherever they came from were responsible for killing so many people on September the 11th and you know talk about falsifying history falsifying the evidence to make it look like you know a madman in a cave in Afghanistan did it was that difficult to come to terms with this is a question i have asked people before because yeah. you're in, you know, you're you're a logical man. You're working in IT, so you deal in yeah. logic. You deal in pragmatism. How Absolutely. did it sit? How did it sit with you, realizing that? Well, this is terribly wrong. Well, it terrified me, Richard. I, <laughs> you know, I'm not ashamed to admit I was absolutely terrified. I mean, it, it it shattered my whole world, and I really had to sort of take a few weeks and months to just pick up the pieces from there and, and slowly sort of come to the re realization that you know the world is not at all as we imagine it to be 
that was that was a really hard to learn lesson and you know being brutal it it, it almost broke up my marriage as well because I sort of imposed a lot of this stuff on my wife she wasn't ready for it I mean everything's great now don't get me wrong but at that time we went through a really difficult patch and and I I think I almost went through a, a, a sort of a mini breakdown if you like until I actually you know got it all together again and, and you know got my head back into into a whole, one whole piece again but it was quite shattering you know it is yeah you go through the disbelief stage then yeah. you go through kind of an awareness where you kind of realize that yes there is something terribly wrong that can yeah. be followed by problems because you start to get fed up about it and then you might have arguments with the people around you and then ultimately you get angry. Maybe there's five stages yeah. to this. I began to get angry because, of course, I famously, not famously, but my audience will know that I broadcast live on that day for one of Ireland's most successful commercial radio stations. I was basically calling it play by play. And wow. in, the, in the ensuing days, I was telling people that a guy with kidney failure in a cave in the Tour of Bora Mountains <laughs> that he pulled it off and I didn't question it you know I just said well this must be true because somebody gave me a sheet of paper and it said it's true <laughs> therefore it must be true and eventually you come out of it and you start to you start to learn to live with it I suppose is what you did and yeah. did your wife then John because I have to mention because you mentioned your wife did she then did she take an interest then in what you were looking into eventually. herself yeah, it took a while. I mean, we went through a really rough patch because I suppose, it, I mean, I, I totally blame myself. I mean, I, I just approached it completely wrongly. I mean, I was so incensed and, and wound up by it that I would just I was just telling everybody and anybody who'd listen to me and, and even people who wouldn't listen to me everything that I knew. And it was just like a brain dump just spewing out of my head. Uh, and I did the same with my wife as well. And of course, that was obviously totally the wrong approach. I should have been much more subtle than that. And obviously, you learn over time to actually do it much more subtly when you're actually uh, approaching people with it for the first time. But in those days, I was just, you know, impetuous and crazy with it. And uh, yeah, like I say, it nearly drove me. It nearly drove me yeah, mad at first. Um, literally, I mean, not not. Uh, I of course. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, it's done that yeah, to a lot so of people. Just to leave 9-11 aside, just one final yeah. question on it. Yeah. L listeners are tweeting me with questions for you saying, why does John think that so many people seemingly accept that those planes could bring down those towers so quickly? Why do so many still think? Because you know, John, if you and your lovely wife go... To a, to a party at the weekend, a Barbie. Well, it's a bit early for Barbies, but when the weather gets a bit better and you're having a Barbie, if you just throw it in, in a non-domineering way, yep. you know you're going to get hammered. I'll go way out of that, John. Why are so many people still believing that story? It's, it's just the power. I mean, the, the, the intense power of propaganda. And we're, when we're faced with propaganda... Uh, from when we woke up in the morning to when we go to sleep at night, uh, it just it's just bombarding us from all directions in the media, everywhere you go, billboards, everything. It's all subtly designed propaganda to keep us in this this fake box of reality. Um, you know that that's the best way I can think of to describe it. Really, it, it's just a it, it, it's just the overwhelming power of the message that has been put across to us all the time. Brilliant. The bigger the lie, the more people are going to believe it. I just want to remind what? our listeners: John Hamer is live on the about time John came on. Really, falsification of history. dot co. dot uk is the website. Let's talk a little bit for a few minutes about be, behind the curtain. John, yeah. I, I am prone to jumping, to jumping around when I get excited. So if I do that, just stop me and say, hang on, <laughs> hang on, Richard. Fine. But behind the curtain, um, brilliant theme. And, and you know, speaking about 9-11, there, there's a lovely woman who works at my local supermarket. Her name is Pat. She's a bright lady. And she found out some time ago what it is I do for a living. And she was kind of taking the mickey out of it, you know, the sorts <laughs> of subjects. And I said, I took, I, I took, um, I took a, a note. I think it was a ten pound note from my wallet, and I asked her to tell me where that came from. And I got the standard answer, you know, from the bank, you know, from the Bank of England. And I said, to her, would yeah, yeah. you believe if I told you, Pat, that we left um, the gold standard many, 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 many years ago, and that financial institutions and the people who owned them, through their ownership of the law and governments, basically fixed it so that they can invent money, they, they can loan money into existence. So when you go and get a loan from them, they're not giving you money that you have. 
It's not money that they have. It's money that they've invented, uh, that they've loaned into existence, but they don't create the interest. Therefore, you're trying to pay back what never existed, but also trying to pay back the interest which they didn't create and all of that. I, I explained it a bit better than that. And yeah, yeah. her head was spinning. And she said, no, that can't be true. I said, no, it is true, Pat. This is the way it works. And yeah. I could see it was causing it was causing a great difficulty for her. John, yeah, cognitive dissonance. Cognitive yeah. dissonance. The, and behind the curtain is your two-volume book on this. This is a... Is, is this the way into getting people, more people, more... You know, your your regular, your friends, your neighbours, your family who ordinarily look at John Hamer or look at David Shaler or whoever it is and say, oh, crazy, crazy people. Is the money system a great way to get people interested in this? And you can talk about that great case that you talk about on your website, the case yeah. of Montgomery versus uh, Daly in 1968 as a way to explaining this. This is great stuff, John. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is. You, you've hit the nail on the head there, Richie. Uh, I, th- this is partly why I did the book. I mean, I was just overwhelmed by by this stuff. But the reason that that these people have so much power and influence and are able to get away with all the stuff that they get away with, and why and and what has enabled them to control the whole world, not just now, but for for centuries and even millennium in the millennia in the past, is that the fact that they've got. Um, total control of the finances and they can uh, do anything they want with the power to, contr- to to create money out of thin air which is what they do obviously uh, that gives them the, the ability to v- virtually do anything that they want and that's really the book actually starts off with um, you know the the ma- mechanics of bank and mor- mortgage fraud and all that sort of stuff and the history of money a little bit but then we go into how history has completely been um engineered if you like by the, the the fact that they have this ability to create money out of nothing and that has an had an impact on on every aspect of our lives for centuries and really that is what the book is all about so it's not i've had people say to me oh i'm not really interested in money or finances it's boring it's dry i say yeah but that's not really what it's about it is about that in a sense but it's more about the impact that that has had on society forever and a day so you know just to put that in, into perspective if anybody's thinking oh I, i'm not interested in finance stuff i'm, I'm not going to read that book it sounds boring as hell well let me assure you even though i wrote it myself I'd, it'll blow your mind honestly it will yeah it's mind, uh, it's a mind-blowing subject this it's hugely important it's, it's, you know i i've interviewed yeah, yeah. some i've interviewed some of the most famous economists i have i've had them on this show right. yeah. uh, people like steve Keen and people like that and i put it to steve and Steve laughed, and, and he agrees, but there's only so Steve will only go so far because of his own yeah. situation. And I said, why would sovereign governments, uh, answerable to the people of their countries, whether it's the Republic of Ireland, Greece, Italy, Spain, or the UK, why would they allow a cartel, invent money out of thin air, and loan it to them to run their public services and their public government, putting them... In, in a never-ending debt cycle, why wouldn't they um, issue their own bonds backed by uh, themselves, um, debt-free currency, effectively? And it's only Keane that really, you know, had the decency to try and answer it. But other economists have dismissed it out of hand and said, oh, you're talking about um, flooding the country with... Um, you're talking about... Ah, um, oh, the, the, the term has gone out of my... Um, quantitative easing and I'm saying no I'm not talking about quantitative easing I'm talking about governments doing what governments need to do for people and paying them themselves if somebody is loaning money into existence why don't we do it for ourselves that's yeah. basically the question John right yeah well the, the reason the reason for that Richie is because um, it may, may sound obvious it may not but the reason is because the governments are not the people Absolutely. who rule us okay the people who rule us are the people who create the money out of thin air so therefore, the government do what the people who create the money out of thin air want them to do. So, you know, it sounds very glib and simple, but that's it in a nutshell. So that's why governments don't change it, because obviously, if they had the real power, they would. There'd be no question about that. They would change things if they could, but they can't because their hands are tied. Why can't people see it? Because it's so obvious. When Corbyn says, 
or you know we will borrow because you have to invest and all of this garbage and of course this is the two party thing which we can yep. talk about and I've spent <laughs> years and years trying to drum this into people I don't yeah, care yeah. how nice Jeremy Corbyn sounds when he says we shouldn't be bombing Yemen by proxy uh, through Saudi Arabia I don't care I don't care even if he means that Corbyn mm. is as bad as May as Carmen as any of the rest of them because when he gets in he's going to, to put the country millions and not millions billions of pounds more in debt by borrowing from these people when are the British public going to say why are we borrowing from these people yeah exactly I mean people don't get into the the I'm probably preaching to the converted here but people don't get into the position that Jeremy Corbyn's in without being part of the problem yeah for us not for them um you know, he is he is only in that position because he's allowed to be, be in that position. There is no question that he's got there under his own steam. He is there as part of an agenda. So whatever Corbyn says, he's he is part of the problem. Whatever it comes out of his mouth, I can guarantee you that when he gets in power, if he gets in power, he will do completely the opposite. We're never or, going to be allowed to leave the European Union, John, are we? I don't think so. Not, not at all. I think it's just a complete sham. It's just a, it's just a charade. It's just part of the uh, the ongoing theatre, isn't it? That, that that is our fake reality. You heard Vince Cable yesterday. He was on Radio Five Live this morning. I do have the audio, but I won't play it. Basically, <laughs> saying that if you're over sixty, you're just a scumbag racist. Basically, that's what Vince. And and to be fair to Nicky Campbell, who who I've criticised a lot on this program. To be fair to Campbell. He said, well, no, that's not what we get because we get a lot of 30-something and 40-something people who, um, you know, say they wanted to leave the European Union because of the imperialism, because of the United States of Europe, because of immigration. And then, to be fair to Campbell, Campbell said to um, Sir Vince Cable, he said, and by the way, a lot of the people who talk about immigration, they're not talking about migrants from Africa. They're not talking about migrants from the Middle East, they're talking about open door European migrants that have come in yeah. and driven yeah. down wages and um, living standards and all of that. So Campbell did his job just for two minutes this morning. Right, but right. Th th these financial institutions, John, you're saying the European Union project, I mean, they, they, they do what they do and they can do what they do by concentrating power in such a small, narrow area. So they want to obviously not just continue with the European Union project, but ultimately head towards a, a, a one world government, which is something yeah. many people were scared of talking about in the past, but that's where they want to go, right? Yeah, I mean, it's part of the plans for the NWO, isn't it? The New World Order. It, it's it's mod The EU is, is modelled on the Soviet Union. It's almost a, a, I was going to say mirror image. It's not really a mirror image, but it's a like-for-like -like image almost of the Soviet Union, the way it works at the top. It's exactly the same, you know, and obviously the Soviet Union was part of the, the ongoing agenda. And that was that was created by it was actually created by the elite, you know, not by the people, not by any sort of people's revolution. It was created by the elite as a way of ushering ushering in totalitarianism through communism through the back door. And the EU is just an extension of that. And that's why, in my view, uh, that the the the. the Iron Curtain countries, the the Soviet Union, the Soviet bloc was, was allowed to die in the 80s and 90s because they had a ready-made replacement there in the EU and it's exactly the same and it works on exactly the same principles. What's going to happen there? Do you think it's going to be, we, we might have an election this year, it might return a coalition government with Labour having the most seats and Corbyn then, of course, who famously spent years on the back benches telling the truth about the European Union when he was a backbencher and what it is and what it was yeah. designed to do, which was to drive wealth uphill and shit downhill to the rest of us, destroy... Yeah. I mean, John, you know, as a Yorkshireman, it has, it's, it has basically destroyed the rural Great Britain. That's what it's done. In fact, yeah. Cable said this morning to Nicky Campbell, he said, oh, we find in the cities that people are more pro-European Union. We find in rural and coastal areas that people are more suspicious of them. I'm thinking no shit paddy. No <laughs> shit paddy in, in rural areas and in coastal areas because agriculture and, of course, fishing, of course, steel, coal, all destroyed at the behest of the European Union. Do you see an election this year, John, 
and uh, you know a greater push either for a vote on the final deal or an absolute all out second referendum do you want to change your mind how do you see it going do you know i absolutely absolutely don't know and i don't care to be honest yeah. i just i just dismiss the whole charade I, I i don't watch news i don't watch mainstream news at all um, I take very, very little interest in politics because every time I hear a politician speak, I feel like putting my foot through the TV or the yeah. radio, whatever happens to be on. Um, I really don't take that much interest, Richard, because I just find the whole thing a total bloody irrelevance, to be quite frank. It is, but the people that we're, you're trying to reach through your books and your articles, I mean, I've been reading the articles on the site, they're very good, John. Really impressed with the writing on the site. The people we want to reach are they're embedded in that system and, and I suppose what this programme tries to do, it doesn't always yeah. succeed, but it's hold a mirror up to it in a way that shows it sure. for what it is um, because people are dependent on it. I mean, I friends of mine fallen for the Corbyn thing. They've fallen for it. You know, he's great. When he gets in, he's great, you know. So, <laughs> social yeah. welfare, he, right. he, you know, he'll start looking after the disabled, all of this sort of stuff and I'm saying, well, he might do for a couple of years but he's going to borrow heavily Eventually, yeah. there'll be interest rate rises. Eventually, there'll be another recession. It'll be a massive financial crash. And yeah. you lose everything. The banks will get it all, John. Yeah, yeah. Well, all that will happen is if Cor Corbyn or the Labour Party gets in, whoever is in charge at that time, they'll just follow an agenda. It won't be exactly the same agenda as the Conservatives followed. But nevertheless, it will be an agenda, not too dissimilar from the Conservatives, um, that's been imposed upon them from on high. There are, the, you know, we're given like it's like a choice between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. You know, we, we've got this ridiculous, and I mean utterly ridiculous, so-called democratic system. I mean, what the hell is democracy? It's just a complete sham. You know, was it Thomas Jefferson that said it's uh, two wolves and a sheep voting yeah. on what to have for dinner? Yeah, and it's exactly that. You know, I couldn't put it any better than that myself. Yeah, our first guest tonight was talking about the massive protest ahead of the Iraq war in 2003. Millions of people. I mean, if, if the populace yeah. ever needed evidence that in the eyes of the establishment they were worthless, they were given that evidence in 2002 and in 2003 when they marched in their millions and said no this country has never done anything to the UK. You cannot invade it. We don't uh, agree with it. And they went ahead and did it anyway. I mean, there you, right there, you had it right there. Of course. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that will just continue. I, I mean, I, you know, I, can, I suppose going back to my own experiences, I mean, I've, I've been on this planet for 65 years now. But, uh, you know, so I've seen quite a few general elections and party politics come and go and you know i i was even in the trap myself you know years ago i was you know i i, I would i would waver from one to the other labor conservative which just have whichever happened to be the flavor of the month and which was getting most favorable press at the time you know i would tend to go with the flow and i think that's what you know 90 percent of people do still yeah. you know it, it's just it's just the way things are and it's part of what what i said at the beginning it's this it's this mass propaganda it's this brainwashing and we just believe that there is no alternative. Oh, well, we've got a democracy. You know, it's great. You've got a choice. Yeah. You've got a choice between death by hanging or death by electric chair. Which one are you going to pick? You know? It, yeah. I was worse than you. I, I was worse than you. At least you were prepared to change from time to time, which showed that you had some semblance <laughs> of normality. Yeah. With me, it was, you know, left wing parties tied into wool, all that nonsense. But I've left all that behind. John Hamer is our guest. Uh, do check out John's website, falsificationofhistory.co.uk. He's the author of uh, Behind the Curtain, The Falsification of History, um, RMS Olympic and Titanic's Last Secret. You might come back in the first week in April, uh, John. Uh, we're not going anywhere yet, but you might come back uh, in the first week in April to talk about the Titanic and the Olympic. That'd be great, actually. Yeah, if I'd love you did to. That. That'd be it's lovely. a fascinating story. Um, you might need about a six-hour program, though, Richie, I'm afraid. Well, we'll do nine. We, well, we can we can guarantee <laughs> ninety minutes, and we'll steer yeah, yeah. we'll steer our way through it. John, I want yeah. to talk about. Um, I, I want to go, go a little bit. You know, maybe a little bit more metaphysical. Get away mm -hmm. from politics. I hear you loud and clear. I'm not deaf. You're not into talking about these parties. Neither are, neither am I tonight. To be honest, I've had enough of it either. The, mo the the monetary stuff is brilliant, by the way. Do check out John's books. Go to the website falsification of history. Um, let me just get that dot co dot uk now. Excellent piece there on Project Bluebeam. 
I really enjoyed that today. Um, right. It's not uh, something I know an awful lot about. It's been mentioned by guests on the program in the past, but it's right up the street of um, <laughs> of our listeners. What right. the bloody hell is Project Bluebeam? <laughs> Over to you. Well. Yeah, as you say, it's a little bit different to party politics. It's yeah. a little bit esoteric, and and some people might think it's an absolute load of nonsense what I'm going to say. But you know, there's plenty of evidence out there for it, as with everything else. And you know, I I, I tend to sort of not touch things that I'm not uh, convinced by. I, I I don't write about things that I'm only sort of partly convinced by. I, I really believe this. I'll, I'll just sort of give you a brief outline, of, you know, you and the listeners, what what, what it was about. It was it was first disclosed by two Canadian investigative journalists about 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago. One guy was called Serge Monast and uh, I, the other one's name escapes me. But uh, they were both Canadians. And uh, after Serge had actually done all this investigative uh, work on it, and sort of started to expose it. He was threatened by the Canadian government. Uh, I mean, that that in itself, to me, you know, w- why would they bother threatening him if it was just a load of nonsense? I mean, the, you, this is what people don't seem to be able to grasp as well. If somebody is being threatened by government, they only do that if you're actually getting to the core of something. Something they don't to bother hide. If, you, yeah. if you're way off beam, they just let you get on with it. But. Serge's child was actually illegally abducted by the government and the parents never saw her again. Okay, so that's point one. And then Monas himself was heart attacked, if if, uh, the listeners understand what that phrase means, along with his colleague in in a very short space of time, a matter of a, a few weeks. They both died of heart attacks and they were only in the 40s. So again, I, I will leave that to people's own judgment as to the, the veracity of that. But what, what Serge and his colleague discovered was that um, this plan called Project Bluebeam, whereby the first stage would be that all current archaeological knowledge is going to be discarded. OK, I mean, a lot of I must say, as a disclaimer straight away, that a lot of archaeological knowledge knowledge is complete nonsense anyway. Uh, which is presented to us through the mainstream. But this this goes a whole a whole lot further. OK, and what they will do is they will plant fake artefacts that are going to suit their agenda. And I'll come on to explain a little bit more about that. I'm just stepping through it bit by bit. And that will they will become exposed from the earth by artificial earthquakes. And we all know that there are artificial you know the the, the uh, ability exists to create artificial earthquakes no that, doubt you know. no doubt absolutely yeah, absolutely so that, that that's that's stage one then what they what they're trying to do they're trying to make the whole world believe that religions are defunct and based on misunderstandings okay so that's going to be the nub of it okay and what because what they're trying to do with this and again i'll come on to the mechanics of it in, in a short time um they're trying to create a one world religion, which will be the foundation of the one world government, i.e. the new world order. OK, so and what there are got, there's lots of films uh, emanating from Hollywood that are going to, you know, that, that have been sort of setting the scenes for this as well. Things like a lot of the alien type films like 2001 on Space Odyssey, Independence Day. Even Star Trek, Star Wars, you know, touches on it, that kind of stuff. And it's what they're going to do is they're going to exhort us all to come together to fight all these nasty aliens that they're going to bring out of the woodwork. And I, and I promise I am going to get on to telling you what, what's going to happen now. OK. Quick recap then, John. They're, yeah. they're, they're, they're going to use weather modification technology to create earthquakes which are going to throw up artefacts of sorts which yes. they're going to say are evidence of the presence of another civilization. Yes. Brilliant, right? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's a much better synopsis than I could. No, have no, well, I had time. No, no, it's not. No, I just had time. To, <laughs> I, I was listening to you and I had time to think of it. So that's that's what they're going to do. And okay. that's going to be quickly followed by... By uh, a massive, and I mean absolutely humongous, worldwide holographic light show complete with 3D holograms and which is going to pertain to be from the voice of God. Now, to, as a prelude to that, 
they've actually got this massive computer somewhere stashed away that's been programmed with every known language and dialect in the world so that nobody is going to escape this. Everybody, Nobody will have the excuse that, oh, I didn't understand all that, because it's going to be uh, blasted at us in every known language and dialect. And right. the sky will basically become a, a giant movie screen and everybody will be conned into thinking that the proclamations are the word of God. And it's not just existing God. This is a new God. And this will be the, they will say it is God, but it will actually be the Zionist Antichrist. Okay. It all sounds very fanciful, doesn't it? Yeah. Very, this, very interesting, this. I, yeah, I, I, well, th th this is true. And then w stage three will be the use of electronic telepathic communication using ELF, VLF and LF waves which will unconsciously or subconsciously permeate the brain and just to put the tin lid on it there'll be a a, a holographic pro projection of this fake alien invasion okay now I say it sounds very unbelievable but this has been corroborated not just by Serge Monast and his colleague but none other than Werner von Braun, who many people will, will know was the father, in inverted commas, of NASA. OK, he, Werner von Braun told this 40 years ago that this was going to happen to a journalist called Carol Rosen, an American journal, journalist, shortly before he died in 1977. OK, and the goal is planetary control under an oppressive one world government, as I, as I said before, the, the the new world order, in other words. Okay. It's a problem reaction solution scenario. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So they throw up this, they, they, they convince the world to come together in the face of a hostile extraterrestrial threat. And they do that using technology that the vast majority of people don't know that they have. And people won't know anything about this holographic technology for sure. But most people yeah. don't even know that the ability is there to make subterranean events happen, make mm. earthquakes happen, uh, Jean. They're going to do this. Yes. And, and NASA is heading this up, is that right? Sorry? Is, is NASA centrally oh, yeah. behind NASA's this? The, NASA's the catalyst, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, obviously Von Braun knew what the agenda was. And if, if it had just been Monast and his colleague and, you, you know, disregarding the fact that his child was kidnapped and all the rest of it and he was heart attacked, you could sort of almost dismiss it. But people like Werner Braun Brown, apparently he didn't only just tell it to Carl Rosen, he told it to other journalists as well, uh, two or three others. And I, I don't know if any of the listeners remember a young investigative journalist or researcher by the name of Rick Clay, who died very suddenly and uh, strangely. I mean, the poor guy was only 21 years old and I was fortunate enough to meet him a year before he died. And he told this to me as well. He told me about Bluebeam before I'd ever heard of it. And that must have been about, about 2007, I guess. I think that was about the time when, when Rick died. But he was, again, the suspicions are that Rick was killed because of this knowledge that he had about Project Bluebeam and he wasn't scared in telling anybody who uh, was willing to listen. Okay. So would... there's so much evidence. It's not, just a, it's not just a case of me picking one guy out and saying, this is what this guy has said, therefore I'm taking that as the truth. This has all come together. It's like a jigsaw puzzle and it's been pieced together. Um, well, I'm very yeah. open-minded to this because my, my understanding has come around to accepting that there is an agenda um, for... Well, th th there is an agenda to control um, every single one of us. There's an agenda yeah. to merge us with technology. There's an agenda to get rid of maybe uh, five and a half billion of us. I have no, no doubt about that either. Yeah. And I'm interested in this. And one, one of my great friends, um, rest in peace, uh, Jim Mars, who I spent years on different platforms speaking to Jim. Jim yeah. was very much convinced of this. And I asked Jim about this one night. Now, I don't know very much about it. Jim just mentioned it briefly about alien invasions. And I asked Jim, I said, well, do you know, because I'm a serial drama follower for my, for my sins, John, I'm pathetic. That's all I do really is watch US very high production serial drama. Yes. And, and, and I've noticed over the last uh, 10 to 15 years that we've had more and more and more new shows 
about aliens. Yeah, hiding it in plain sight, in other words. Yeah, yeah, almost conditioning people. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And Jim yeah. went, and Jim was like, "Yeah," and, and he was very interested in that, Jim. This sudden right. deluge of, uh, of 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 um, of shows all dealing with aliens invading as a central uh, as a central theme. Yeah. The, the death of these journalists is obviously incredibly suspicious. Would NASA be in charge of this alone, John, or are they? Is this are they collaborating with other space agencies around the world? I guess they'd have to, and I and I also guess they'd have to be collaborating with governments as well. And of course, governments won't won't tell us anything. It comes back to what we were saying earlier in the show, Richie. You know, they're yeah. they're they're controlled from above anyway. They are not the people in charge, so they're not going to sort of veto it. They'll go along with it. You know, it, it's as simple as that. You know, I, I, I'm a big believer in that. My research has actually told me over the years that the, there's never any smoke without fire with these things you know obviously no absolute proof but but given the track record of these psychos then you know um i find the whole thing very plausible i have to say is there i mean some of my guests over the years people i've known for many years they believe that there's also interdimensional manipulation going on is that something you were interested in, John? You don't have to be, of course. You can say whatever yeah, you want to hear. So I'm not interested in it, but I've certainly not gone there, if you like. I've not actually looked into that. I'm interested in anything that, that's sort of out of the ordinary like that. But yes, I've never sort of uh, looked at it in any depth, Rich, you know. Yeah, same as me. I, I, I love listening to our guests talking about it, but that's yeah. all I've ever been able to do. I've not been able to read the text and the books. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, David Icke stuff, I've read Jim Mars, other people, but um, th- yeah. that's, that's absolutely fascinating. John, yeah. what sort of this is this is incredibly fascinating. Let me just remind our listeners: John Hamer is live with us tonight from Yorkshire. Falsificationofhistory.co.uk is John's website. He's written several books. We've talked about them already. Uh, check them out, by the way. Um, and it's terrific to have him on because much of what John is researching is of great interest uh, uh, to us, of course. So check him out, falsificationofhistory.co.uk. I wonder what sort of time frame, John, they're looking at. And I wonder before, if, 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 if this is a definite goer, if this is definitely something that might very well happen, if some yeah. sort of physical chaos will be caused before this, you know, fake, you know, metaphysical chaos in terms of, you know, massive financial crashes, maybe a big war to yeah. precede that. What do you think? Yeah, I tend to think that. I tend to think it will be the, the old financial crash that's been talked about in these circles for, for many a long year now. I tend to think it, it, it's probably going to be some catastrophic event that is going to catch everybody's attention, <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, I, suppose, I suppose, John, if you broke people, I mean, I, I speak to various financial people, as I've already mentioned, and they, they, they all agree that the next crash is going to be fairly horrible and might make 2008 look small, beans really compared to it i suppose if you break people spiritually if you destroy them if you take from them you know the basic human rights of heat and light and food if you make life that unbearable jesus yeah, they make they'd, very good listeners doesn't it they'd be wide open to it wouldn't they absolutely yeah so I, as for time scales i couldn't really say um i suspect it's fairly fluid the time scale i, I think i think you know they have this agenda in in place but you know it, it has by its very nature to be fluid i think and it's got to they've got to put certain things in place and they never know how long that's going to take that stage this bit and that bit they just sort of in some ways they sort of sort of bumble along you know although there's a sort of a, a set in, agenda in a sense it's also quite fluid as well depending on what happens because you know no matter we, we, we come out with glib statements like oh these people control the world well they don't control absolutely everything because no. that's impossible but you know they can't they can't control absolutely every element of every single thing in the world it's not it's not they don't they don't control you they don't control me but i tell you what exactly. sorry, you're making a brilliant point here they play the long game. And yeah. again, other researchers have traced the lineage. These are the royal families of the world married into the world's big banking powerhouses. Yeah. These people played the long game. Absolutely. Let, let me read a few tweets, um, John. Um, sure. David tweets, we've been under a pre-programming agenda since Star Trek. Roddenberry, Lucas, Spielberg, all insiders, says David. Interesting enough, I did watch the... Last Jedi film yesterday, uh, as a matter of interest. Moinga tweets, uh, he quotes Werner von Braun, or von Braun, 
uh, who once said, once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? That's not my department, uh, says Werner <laughs> von Braun. Yeah. I've uh, not heard that. That's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. well sad, it's not but it's, it's yeah. sad, but brilliant. It, it, it fits yeah. in. It segues. Now, uh, Mark tweets uh, a really interesting image and a link to um, uh, your website and an image about Pro- uh, Project uh, Blue Beam there. Loads of interest in this. Hi to Maz Roth. Uh, thanks for your uh, meme there and your tweet. I'll retweet all of that. Uh, Liz tweets, Richie, perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognise this common bond. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would wish. Uh, excuse me, let me. She's tweeted a quote from Ronald Reagan, who said in 1987, perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognise this common bond. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. How, yeah. I didn't know that Reagan said that. Wow. Yeah, I'd heard that. Yeah, I mean, it's not just Reagan. I mean, they all say it in different ways and different times. It's what they want, isn't it? They want us all to come together, but they don't want us to come together as intelligent thinking people. They want us to be an unintelligent, unthinking, amorphous mass who all believe the same things. And that's really what Reagan was saying, if you read between the lines. Pretty much. And and I tend to believe through researching the space fence, the space grid, 5G, Wi-Fi, Barry Troer and people like that, and again, others who've come on the programme, I, I I think Project Blue Beam as a as a as a as a definite plan fits into the transhumanist agenda, John. It fits into merging, especially young children, more and yeah. more and more with technology, doesn't it? it That's must a great do. point, actually, Richard. Not thought about that, but yeah, absolutely, it does. Yeah. You see children today, you know, I talked about being in, the, the, you know, the lovely Tatton Park. We've been in Yorkshire, wonderful place. The future Mrs. Allen and I, we see children walking around. There are deer to the left of you. There are rabbits to the to the right. And the children are glued to the phone. And of course, yeah. Oxford University researchers have said it's actually rewiring the brain, their addiction to this technology. And that could lend it to becoming more... Um, acquiescent in the future to this sort of yeah. thing you're talking about. It's creating a generation of passive people, isn't it? Jesus. Who, who don't take any notice of what is going on in the world around them. All they're, all they're focusing in on is themselves and their immediate peer group. You know, that's all they're interested in. And maybe what the latest music is or which trashy shows on TV. Uh, but other than that, I mean, it sounds a terrible thing to say, but I. It, it's true. I mean, kids of today, they know nothing. You know, they come out of school and they know absolutely nothing, almost less than when they went in. I mean, don't get me started on school. That's another a whole topic for an, another discussion sometime. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it, it's it's sad. You know, even, even my children, my children, one's in his 20s and the other's in his 30s. When I think of the knowledge, the general knowledge about things that they have, it's far less than what I had at that age or that, you know, probably anyone else had. It's, it's almost like we're being, well, it's not almost like, we are being dumbed down systematically. Yeah, some univer- some some professors in Korea, in South Korea, did a study. Um, it came out late last year. The, the mainstream media has basically ignored it. But they found that the devices, not only are they, not only are they causing serious problems with attention span for youngsters, but they're also creating big gaps in their memory. So even yeah. things that they have learned from mum and dad or from granddad or grand, grandma or whatever, they're, they're forgetting them. Their ability to retain information is, yeah. is dwindling at a rate of knots. It's, it's, it's terrible. It, it really yeah. is. And, and, you know, I'm going to be speaking to a lady on the programme tomorrow night about 5G and stuff like that. Anne-Marie Carey right. is coming on the programme. Okay. Um, let me give a big shout, John, to um, your website again. Uh, but, but before I do that, actually, John, you can follow John on Twitter. It's um, at John Hamer Author, at John Hamer Author on Twitter. Follow John on Twitter there because he tweets regularly. And uh, as I said, the website is uh, falsificationofhistory.co.uk. The likes of Project Bluebeam, John, What what's really standing? Is there anything standing in the way of that? 
What could stop that? Well, I mean, if that's the agenda, who could do anything about it? You, you, you talk. You're a rational man. You're a, you, you know, you're a self-educated man. You write well. You're lucid. You're, you're interesting. I could listen to you all night. But most people in my neighbourhood and your neighbourhood, they hear you talk about Project Bluebeam and they say, "Geez, I thought that John Hamer was all right. I thought he was on the level." You know, I'm. 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 Listen to the show now. Yeah. Actually, I think, yeah. And even about you know, even about me, uh, you, you know, that's probably what they think. So if that's the case, what could possibly stop them doing it? Um, I, not a lot. Not I mean, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> What they're waiting for is an opportunity, isn't it? And whether that opportunity is a massive financial crash, some sort of, I don't know, electromagnetic, in, 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 electromagnetically induced storm that shuts all the electricity down for a long period. I mean, just imagine if that happened. I mean, that would destroy society as we know it. Say if, say if there was no electricity throughout the world for for two months or three months, you know, the world would go crazy. I mean, we'd be we'd be in oh, yeah. we'd be in the Stone Age. Yeah, and you know, so something like that. That is what they're waiting for. Although I suppose you could argue if that happened, then they wouldn't really be able to uh, pull that plan off. But that was just an example off the top of my head. But it's I think it's just some sort of as we, as we said before, some sort of engineered uh, disaster of some kind, and I couldn't begin to guess what it is. Although I guess the financial one is probably the most likely. Do you remember in the second Matrix film, Neo meets the architect of the Matrix? Yes. And if I read this right, because the, the second Matrix was like the Godfather part two. Most people didn't know what was going on. I yeah. Mean, you know, <laughs> if you think of the trilogy, it makes sense in the third film. But in the second one, you're like, what is going on here? But I think yeah. the architect basically says to Neo, you're like version six or version seven. That's, you know, that's the, an, an anomaly that's tried to destroy the program. But, yeah. you, but, you know, you, 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 your predecessors didn't make it. You're not going to make it. And I wonder, John, and I, I certainly don't want to be closing out our chat tonight on a negative, but I wonder if we're doomed to, to, to whatever this agenda wants, whatever this cabal wants, if we're doomed to have to endure it, that there isn't anything. Because people have become so selfish. Jesus, Sky News last week did a, uh, look, I know I shouldn't say, you know, I shouldn't be giving any credence to what Sky News says, but I believe their report that says 60% of the country, John, doesn't know who's living next door to them because we don't yeah. care. You know, yeah. what are we going to do? I mean, are, are we doomed? Um, it depends. I mean, there is an esoteric answer to that, and and that a lot of people believe it, and I sort of waver on this as well. But um, and that is the fact that you know karma comes into play as well. Will they be struck by karma before they get chance to actually put it into into play? And I think yeah. that's that's quite a, a a moot question, if you like. Um, I don't know. I don't obviously don't know the answer. I know you're not expecting an answer, but no, so. I'm not. No, no, I'm, it's 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 no, it's it's good what you're saying, John. And yeah. you talk about chaos, and you talk about. I mean, if the whole yeah. thing is a mathematical construct of sorts, anyway. You know, I love yeah. the old Jeff Goldblum Jurassic Park. A butterfly flaps its wings in Peking, yes. and you get rain in New York. And boy, that I think, if you do decent things, David Shader said this in yeah. Air One, former MI5 agent. If you do decent things, and if you think decent things you're changing the world around you anyway exactly yeah so who knows it is the bottom line i guess um uh, probably not a very satisfactory answer but who knows really um yes there are things there are, there is a way of looking at it that says well we're totally powerless and there's nothing we can do to stop them they could just get on and do whatever they want and the other like i say is a more esoteric viewpoint and maybe karma or maybe god whatever you believe him to be or not to be Maybe he will step in. I don't know. Um, you know, it's just it's just pure speculation. But do, um, do me a favour. I wouldn't favor. say we're totally doomed. I think that's probably the best bottom line we could hope for. I believe I go along with that. I don't think so yeah. either. I think if I thought that, I wouldn't be able to sit here and then no. finish. No. Finish. Don't make any point, would they really? No, <laughs> and look yourself in the mirror, and you wouldn't be able to write your books or, or write no. your articles either. Do us a favour. Come back um, the first week in April. I'm away the second week, so I'll be away okay. on the 12th. Uh, I know a lot about the Titanic. Well, I know a lot about the official story of the Titanic because <laughs> I loved I loved the story as a as a boy. But I know what your central 
thesis is and I do go along with it I have to say I do like okay. what you've been saying about the Titanic and yeah. the Olympic so in the first week in April let's get yeah, you back sure. on and let's do uh, 90 minutes on that oh, I'd love to yeah I'd be I mean, the, you say that you, you know what the premise is but you'd be surprised about how much evidence there is for it it's just it's just mountains and tons of the stuff I don't that doubt it that story is just not at all what you imagine it to be it's it's quite again it was another one of those jaw-dropping moments when I actually started to look into that and um it it floored me well, I, I just well this so year much stuff there that it's just it's incredible I can only well, imagine the whole book for a start I can only imagine and this year of course is the 106 106th I think anniversary of the yeah. uh, of the thinking folks go to falsificationofhistory.co.uk there are links there to John's uh, books. I, I said it before and I'll say it again. Support independent writers like John because if you don't, um, they won't continue to write books and um, you know, and write their articles on their websites. It's very, very good. It's very thought-provoking, very challenging stuff and it's important. Thanks for coming on, John. That, that was the fastest 51 minutes that um, <laughs> I've spent for quite a while. I do mean that and oh, I can't you, wait. It's very no, I, mean it. so I enjoyed every minute myself, actually. It's been really good to talk to you. Ah, well, thanks for that and let's, um, let's look forward to uh, the first week in April. We'll do a whole uh, show on the uh, Olympic and the Titanic. That'll be brilliant. Yeah, I look forward to it. Cheers, Cheers mate. Look after yourself. You too, man. That was brilliant. John Hamer, live on the line to us there from Yorkshire. Top man. Check out falsification of history.co.uk that's John's website his books are there there's a load of interesting articles there written by him and by guests you've got articles on finance on Project Blue, Project Blue Beam we've just been talking about that Madeleine McCann as well and lots more besides check it out